Hi, everyone. My name is Joseph Campana. I'm a professor of English here at Rice University and the director of the Center for Environmental Studies. For those of you who have been at sessions today already, welcome back. Um, and for those of you who are new, welcome. Um, we're really excited for today's session, um, which we're calling What We're Reading, which is uh, named after a channel on our new public facing site that's all about books. Um, and we, we're excited to, to feature what is an important um, off the presses publication. I was struggling earlier to, to with whether or not a digital, you know, in the digital world, something is hot off the presses, but this is a book hot off the press um, that has just come out this May, and we're um, sure that many, many people are reading Depeche Chakrabarty's The Climate of History in a Planetary Age. Um, I'll be in conversation with Professor Chakrabarty and with uh, my colleagues Randall Hall and Simony Howe, who I'll introduce briefly first. Um, then I'll introduce Professor Chakrabarty, who will speak for 10 or so minutes about the, the journey of the book from what I know many of us know as incredibly iconic and influential essays um, towards this book through a lot of complicated history um, in between. Um, after that, we'll launch into conversation um, and we'll also be bringing in your questions, which you can leave at any point for us um, on the Q&A function, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So first off, let me introduce my great colleagues uh, who I'm excited to be in conversation with because I'm always excited to work with them. First, Randall Hall, uh, William P. Hobby Professor of American History, a specialist in Southern history, economic history, and US environmental history. He is also the editor of the Journal of Southern History, um, uh, an important publication anchored here at Rice, um, and the author of Mountains on the Market, um, Lum and Abner, and William Lewis Podiat, a leader of the progressive era South. Um, so thanks, Randall, for joining. Um, and also, Simony Howe, Professor of Anthropology and graduate of director, uh, director of Graduate Studies in the Department of Anth Anthropology, um, whose research concerns anthropogenic climate change and how it demands new ways of imagining collective futures. She's the author of Intimate Activism, um, published by Duke University Press, um, Ecologics, Wind and Power in the Anthropocene, also Duke, um, and the important edited collection, The Anthropocene Unseen. A lexicon, um, which came out from Punctum Books, um, and which she worked on with Anand Pontian. Um, and with Dominic Boyer, um, she is the creator um, of the film Not Okay, a little movie about a small glacier at the end of the world. So I'm so excited to be in conversation with Randall and Simony. Now, the main event. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce Dipesh Chakrabarti, the Lawrence A. Kimpton Distinguished Service Professor in History, South Asian Languages and Civilizations, and the College. He's the faculty um, director of the University of Chicago Center in Delhi, a faculty fellow of the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory, an associate of the Department of English, um, which of course makes me happy being a member of a Department of English, um, and a faculty fellow of the, uh, and, and also um, by courtesy, a faculty member of the law school. Um, I mention all these appointments because it suggests the breadth of his contributions um, to energy and environmental humanities, um, which seems appropriate given the way that his writing focusing, focuses our attention on a core feature of environmental thinking um, that we always have to grapple with, which is scale. From the massive scale of anthropogenic um, impact on climate and environment to even more massive planetary scales, which render humans very tiny indeed. We're here today to speak with him about the climate of history in a planetary age, as I said, released this month from the University of Chicago Press. It's no ex exaggeration to marvel at the scale of the impact of these essays, particularly the climate of history for, the for theses. Um, we were just remembering the kind of the green room before, before we started. Um, it was that essay that brought him to Rice and, and that sort of the beginnings of this book, um, as Rice was also beginning its own sort of commitment to energy humanities through a Sawyer Mellon seminar and then through the founding of, of um, SENS. Um, today we'll be talking about the extraordinary scale of impact of that work. Um, but I also would be remiss if I didn't say what many fans of his work already know um, that the import of the role he's played in post-colonial studies can't be overestimated. Um, and it also fascinatingly marks his transit from terms like globe to, to a term like globe to another like planet. He's a founding member of the editorial collective of Subaltern Studies, a consulting editor of Critical Inquiry, and a founding editor of Postcolonial Studies. Before publishing The Climate of History in a Planetary Age um, and his recent The Crises of Civilization, Exploring Global and Planetary Histories, um, Professor Chakrabarty was the celebrated author of Rethinking Working Class History, Bengal 1890 to 1940, Provincializing Europe, um, Postcolonial Thought and Historical Difference, Habitations of Modernity, Essays in the Wake of Subaltern Studies, and The Calling of History, Sujaduddinath Sarkar and His Empire of Truth. 
uh, the marks of distinction for his work are so many, I can't cite them all, but it would be remiss if I didn't mention at least a few. He's the recipient of the 2014 Toynbee Foundation Prize for his com contributions to global history, the 2019 Tagore Memorial Para uh, Prize awarded by the government of West Bengal for the crisis of civilization. He's received honorary degrees from the University of London and the University of Antwerp. Um, and he was elected an honorary fellow of the Astral Australian Academy of the Humanities and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, the breadth of that work is also recognized in the many distinguished lecture series for which he has been the uh, invited guest. Um, the uh, inaugural lecture at the Tagore program at UC Berkeley, um, the Mandel Lectures in the Humanities at Brandeis, the William James Lecture at the Harvard Divinity School, the Otto Kaysen Lecture at the University of Toronto, the Tanner Lectures of Human Values at Yale, and the upcoming Countercurrents um, at the University of Cambridge. I just want to make one last word um, from my own point of view as a poet and as a scholar of early, mo early modern European literature, which I hope Professor Chakrabarty will appreciate, um, an era whose writers, um, some of whom he mentions, of course, um, Jean Baudin, William Shakespeare, John Selden, Hugo Grotius, Thomas Hobbes, John Milton, drew the attention of figures who in the mid 20th century, early to mid 20th century, were defining how we talk about sovereignty um, and the very idea of a globe in their own particular 20th century ways, Carl Schmidt and Hannah Arendt, Ernst Kantorowicz, Max Weber, um, and whose ongoing impact is, lives with us and, is, and really marks Professor Chakraborty's latest book. So I hope he'll indulge me um, uh, it, with a kind of final quote, um, actually from John Milton's Paradise Lost. Um, and not because I'm, in, <laughs> I'm comparing Professor Chakrabarty to the main figure I'm discussing here. Um, but after he escapes his fiery prison, um, Satan flies to the created universe, offering Milton's readers a fascinating and ambivalent perspective. Um, Satan, whose build is so massive, it's hard to describe, is tiny relative to that universe, and he's often battered by the gusts of winds and the other chaotic processes of the universe. Finally, he perches in safety to see the earth dangling from the sapphire heavens from which he is exiled. And here's a famous quote from that poem of that vision. Fast by hanging in a golden chain, this pendant world, in bigness as a star of smallest magnitude, close by the moon. The history of reading Paradise Lost is a history of being seduced by Satan, only to re reject later his distorted views. But his point of view in he here is, in fact, not distorted. Whatever the Earth is, both globe and planet, perhaps at the same time, it's a scalar paradox of a certain kind. It in bigness is a star of smallest magnitude, close by the moon. What is a planet? What is a globe? What is the earth? These are questions Milton was asking, but these are very powerful questions Depeche Chattrabarty helps us answer um, in our moment, as we realize that there are different answers to those questions in different historical moments, and especially in the pressing moment we're in now, often referred to as the Anthropocene. So I'm grateful for his work um, that allows us to access and to think about these paradoxes of scale and that reveal us as tiny living figures, furiously damaging a, a world we cannot quite understand as the planets and stars spin often indifferently on. So please welcome um, Professor Depesh Chakrabarty and Professor Chakrabarty, if you could take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe, for that very uh, beautiful, thoughtful, and, and, and warm introduction, uh, but, but beautiful and thoughtful in terms of what you had to say. Is this volume okay? Am I audible? It's okay? Good, thanks. Yes, sounds good. Um, okay, good. Um, so um, just, um, it's a great <laughs> pleasure and, and an honor to be back talking with you people because I was at Rice uh, soon after that first article was published. Uh, and I think Dominic and Semini invited me. Uh, that's when I met Tim Morton, and that started a uh, significant series of conversations, conversations that I carried on with him, sometimes in writing, but reading him uh, uh, over these years, uh, but also being in conversation with Dominic and Simini, uh, including a, a podcast interview uh, about that, that article. Uh, so Rice has been uh, <coughs> uh, part of this journey. I just maybe mentioned two or three things about uh, the journey, about how I, well, I mean, I tell, I tell the story of how I came to write this book. I came to write this book through my involvement with Australia, really. It's the, it's the huge fires of 2003 that um, destroyed a lot of natural spots and, and produced a sense of bereavement, in, which got me 
interested in thinking about fires and then on to climate change and uh, global warming. And, um, and I was just blown away to read that human beings had become a geological force and a geological force capable of changing the climate system of the whole planet. That kind of scalar conception of human agency uh, uh, really sort of <clears throat> uh, kind of blew apart the assumptions with which I used to work and still work as a humanist historian, uh, concerned with a few hundred years at the most. And there was a certain way in which as a humanist historian, I used to take the world as given, uh, mountains and rivers. And as I mean, even after reading Brodel, you kind of thought, okay, there's an agency, but it's cyclical and it's slow, but it's there, but nothing beyond that. Um, <clears throat> there was obviously no um, model uh, book to follow. Uh, when I did my thesis, which became my first book on in labor history, there was E.P. Thompson's, The Making of the English Working Class, as a model to argue with, to disagree with, uh, to agree with. I mean, here there was no model because <clears throat> I was, it, because really the, the climate science literature kind of challenged some of the basic assumptions of uh, humanist history writing. And I was interested in that challenge and kind of understanding the nature of the challenge. As I worked through these questions from one question, tunneling sort of from one question to another question, uh, I also kept uh, correcting my errors because people would point out to me what I'd gotten, gotten wrong. Like for instance, uh, I drew the distinction in that first article between geology and biology a little too sharply without realizing that this is a planet where geology and biology are connected. You can't separate them. So that eventually I began to use the word geobiology uh, and that life itself is a biological agent. And, and as uh, people have argued scientists from uh, for the last three decades at least. So those were things I was <laughs> learning. And initially I was working with the idea of the Anthropocene, which I still do somewhat, but uh, the Anthropocene question was giving rise to debates, uh, which initially were interesting. And these were debates with people, friends on the left who were saying it should be called capitalocene, it should be called plantationocene, or there's also Donna Harris, wonderful expression, which I can't pronounce. But, uh, uh, but people were disagreeing with the, word, the, the use of the word anthropos in anthropocene. And, and this was all, some of this was coming from climate justice argument that only a minority of nations and a minority of, the, of humans uh, are actually involved in heating up the planet, emitting greenhouse gases, but the results fall mostly on people who are not historically responsible for, uh, for the greenhouse, for the global warming problem. All of those were valid questions. Uh, and I, the, the, I was not disagreeing with them, but I, I thought that the equipment one gets from Marxism or e equipment one gets from anti-imperial thought normal doesn't include geology <laughs> or doesn't include paleoclimatology as part of it. So I realized that however you come to it, you're actually reading another body of literature. So I sometimes joking that I would say, but this is a Marxism plus problem. You know, it, it, it's, it's not just a just problem that Marxists can on their own understand and solve. Um, but <laughs> later on, particularly through my discussions with uh, uh, with um, Jan Zalasovic, uh, who became a friend uh, through the course of this work, who also headed up the, uh, the, the, the working group on the Anthropocene at uh, the Stratigraphic Commission. I, I realized another problem and you know, the Tanner lectures and all these were part of working through this, uh, these questions. The problem I realized was that the Anthropocene so whether you call it plantation, whatever you call it, if it is going to be a geological epoch, which is the lowest, the smallest periodizing unit in geology, 
then normally a, an epoch lasts for about 10 million years, 20 million years. And I realized that if Anthropocene turns out to be an epoch and not an era, so if this actually leads to a sixth great extension, then Zalasu is always telling me that you would have to upgrade it to Anthropozoic era. The era is a much bigger periodizing uh, division. But if it was really like 10 million years, 12 million years, and, and an epoch, even then the Anthropocene would most likely outlast humans. So, uh, because it's a much longer period than what we can visualize as, as human futures. And the question I was left with was really how does, so in some ways then Anthropoc Anthropocene is profoundly a non-human strategy because it outlasts humans. So I was thinking, so how does one bring it back into humanist concerns? I mean, in what sense is the Anthropocene a concern of humanists? And for me, the mediating category, the category that brings the Anthropocene within a human, human and humanist realm of things was the planet. Uh, in other words, to think of deep history, to think of this earth system, this, this planet actually working like uh, uh, a system in which geology, biology, and the processes are connected, the planetary processes are connected. And I, I kind of stumbled on that distinction initially through a conversation with a French philosopher, Catherine Malibu, who had in a critique of my essay, first essay, and uh, Daniel Smale's book on deep history and the, and the brain had pointed out that the word globe in global warming didn't have exactly the same meaning as the word globe in globalization. And, and working through that, and, and I was aware that Eugene Thacker and Guy Spivak in different contexts had spoken about planet, planetarity and planet. I stumbled on that distinction, globe and the planet, and then worked through it. And as I worked through it, I began to read Earth system scientists as fellow historians, telling much larger scale histories, which they research using different methods, uh, but they debate. And once I began to read them as historians, uh, using scientific methods to tell a history, and it's the history of the planet in which humans come too late to be at the center of the story. I realized that the global was about how humans have made this world into a connected entity for humans. So the, the story of the global is what has humans at the center of it. But the story of the planet, which is the story that humans tell, so it's not a story that the planet is telling because the earth system is a human construction, it's a construction by scientists based on big data, satellite measurements, computer modeling, all of that, it's, it's in that sense, a little bit like Tim's uh, hyper object, uh, something that has an object like impact on us, but doesn't exist as an object that you can bump into. Uh, uh, I realized that the scientists themselves react as humans to the construct that they've created as scientists. So once they, for instance, the fact of global warming for them is a scientific fact. But to call it dangerous is a human response. I mean, the word dangerous is not scientist. It's not a science word. It comes out of their response as citizens, which is why they write popular books and things. And that's why I realized that the, that the scientists themselves as human beings were actually having very human-like responses, raising questions like, can a technological high-tech civilization survive? Will we survive? Will our civilization survive? Which are not scientific questions. But these were questions that were being raised by what they had observed through their scientific uh, measurements and our debates and arguments. So for me then, the planet became the way, the, the term with which to mediate between the small scale of human lives, the hundred year scales of our institutions, and this very large scale phenomenon called the Anthropocene, planetary processes and all that. So that's why I have a chapter called the planet, a humanist category, and distinguishing it from Heideggerian world, uh, globe and all of those things. 
Um, by the time I came to give the Tanner lectures, I was already, I was clear that, <clears throat> that once you become aware that the world cannot be taken just as given. In other words, once you lose your innocence about mountains and rivers and landscapes, and they're not simply a background on which human history happens. Uh, and once the scale, is, scale goes even beyond the normal scales of environmental history, uh, you, you get a different perspective on, on human beings, a different from what the story of globalization would give you. And I also got, I also got to the, to the uh, thought that the human condition has changed profoundly today. How much it has changed, and it, that's why when I begin the book, the Harvard historian Charles Meyer, and here I speak as a historian, was wrote an essay for American Historical Review called Consigning the 20th Century His to History. So as you would expect, it came out in the year 2000. And you read that essay by a leading historian, respect to erudite historian, he says everything about the 20th century, but there's not a word about global warming. Even though the scientists were talking about it from the 1980s, but humanists hadn't uh, picked it up. Whereas if, I, if you read the late um, Christopher Bailey's second volume on the modern world, uh, there is indeed discussion of Anthropocene. So, So what has shifted is that whether we think about it or not, we are every day talking about planetary processes. So when we, as I explained, when we talk about everyday distinction between renewable and non-renewable energy sources is actually a distinction between human time and planetary time. Because if humans could hang around for a few hundred million years, the planet would make so-called non-renewable resources again. So on a larger time scale, they may not be as non-renewable as we think they're, or when you think about excess carbon dioxide, it is excess for us human beings. If, you, if humans were not here, the planet would take its time dealing with the so-called excess carbon dioxide. So I realized that the planet was seeping into our consciousness in, the, in this century. And I kept asking myself, how would Hannah Arendt update her book? because she wrote that book in the shadow of the Sputnik. And she looked on the Sputnik as uh, both optimistically and, and critically. She said, well, it means that the species will be able to survive by going somewhere else, but we will suffer Earth alienation. And, and that was the price to pay. And today, of course, that very, you don't have a uh, certain answer to the question <laughs> whether the species will survive. I mean, uh, we all hope it will, uh, but I realized that the human condition is that shifted. And so the book kind of also became um, a way of thinking about the changed human condition. Uh, so it, it's about these two different perspectives on hum humanity, one I call global, the other I call planetary. Uh, using global and planetary as somewhat periodizing device for history writing, for humanist history writing, uh, so that in the planetary age, you become much more aware of deep history. So I mean, deep history is something that's always there. I mean, the fact that uh, uh, we, this, this human shape that we all have, I mean, that's been produced over millions of years, uh, but at the same time, it's part of your autobiography. Uh, and your particular shape goes as you as you die, but someone else comes wearing that shape in a slightly different form. Uh, so, but becoming aware of that deep history around you uh, is what it brings the planetary perspective, but it makes your own consciousness interdisciplinary because you you can't think of deep history without reading historians who use very different methods, uh, very different. Uh, so it, very different research questions, very different uh, uh, research programs, 
Uh, so, so when you think of deep history and bring it into uh, your own uptake, uh, it also makes your thinking uh, interdisciplinary. It opens it up to some of the scientific disciplines. Yeah. So I'm, maybe I'll stop there and uh, start the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe I will uh, pass the baton to my colleague, Simone Howe. Let her sort of start us off. Is that all right, Simone? Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you, Dipesh. That was a fantastic intro to a wonderful book, and we have lots of questions for you. Um, I like how you brought in the humanity of the, of the physical sciences, and also how you see that the historical practice of earth system scientists, right, as a kind of historical practice in itself. There's a really important point that you make throughout your book that acting upon environmental precarity or the Anthropocene condition doesn't deny or ignore the political concerns of racial justice or of wealth disparities or of settler colonial dispossessions, but rather, as you put it, it renders them layered in figurative and real terms uh, with anthropogenic impact on Earth systems. So these are really intersectional struggles for justice is what I'm sort of interpreting through that. But you also write of these finite calendars um, where in the struggle against capitalism or dispossession among nation states at least, the attitude has been that we have time aplenty to settle these historical questions of injustice. There's this kind of open-ended timeline, an indefinite calendar uh, in contrast to this dangerous climate change, right? Which again, as you say, is a, a particular affective designation, which really suggests urgent action. So how do you think through these different scales of urgency um, and attentions that we give to political action on behalf of all of these intersecting struggles around justice and precarity, especially as you put it uh, in the book that we're now living in different now times. There's the now time of our own awareness that's located in human history and humanistic perception and the long now of geobiological time, which is a, a whole different scalar kind of question. So how do, we, how do we sort of legitimately focus those attentions and political priorities given the, the multiple um, needs that we see surrounding us? So, so I would say, first of all, you know, going back a little bit in, little bit in history, recent history, you have to realize that um, these, um, I mean, we have been kind of taking advantage of planetary processes, uh, actively uh, intervening in them uh, for quite some time now. So for instance, um, drawing, uh, nitrogen out of the air for to produce artificial fertilizers, which is a process that has been with us since the Great War, uh, right? Uh, every time we use a build concrete or we use a brick built building and uh, we use up fresh water and fresh water that doesn't cycle back. Uh, I mean, every brick building is a certain amount of fresh water loss from the hydrological cycle. Uh, the fact that we got to know more about bacteria and viruses in the 20th century, so that by the Second World War, uh, uh, antibiotics were saving lives. So, for you, so this human flourishing that we could grow in numbers from 1.6 billion in 1900 to 6 billion in 2000 is based on the fact that, uh, you know, that normally what we call mastery of nature, <laughs> that we were actually uh, peering into planetary processes, like viruses, bacteria are very ancient forms of life. We are producing knowledge about them in order to control them, in order to sometimes deal with them, kill them, whatever. So for a long time, this kind of mixing it, mixing it in for the, with the planetary pressure, you know, hanging out with the planet as it were, was working well for us. We grew in numbers, our longevity grew, our levels of consumption grew, uh, the amount of energy we could consume through the in, invention of electricity and other things, the conveniences grew, 
right? So when you look at the 20th century, everything just goes up, you know, cars, car consumption, petrol consumption, everything. And so the, the, the civilization from which we've benefited, you know, which has produced the MRI machines, the, the fact that we can now make uh, what used to be completely life threatening diseases into chronic illnesses, which allows us to add productive years to our life. All of those things have been made possible because we have been increasingly taking on a geological agency without calling it by that name, right? So it, sometimes I say it's as if, uh, you know, you've been living it up for many generations and suddenly you know, in a wonderful five-star hotel, making a five-star hotel out of the earth ship as much as you can of producing mass poverty too, on the, because the numbers grew. So you had the masses to, to produce mass poverty. Uh, and, and inequality may have been uh, one way in which we grew. I mean, as Marxists would say, it's, you know, it's kind of central to the accumulation process and all that. But, but we produced a domain where humans, their technologies, and the animals we keep or farm or eat, and urban and other wild animals that depend on us, on us for their survival, like urban squirrels. Right? That has come to be a dominant complex that dominates the order of life, where we actually represent a minority form of life. I mean, the, the majority forms of life are microbial, right? So our increasing knowledge of this, of this how the planet works and how basically has been uh, of tremendous uh, benefit to us. You know, if global warming was not happening and scientists hadn't noticed it, we would have probably been on that trajectory unquestioning. The China would have said, let's grow and pull millions out of poverty. India would have said, let's grow and pull millions out of poverty. So, so when scientists talked about global warming, it came as suddenly as a, as a party spoiler to the Indians and the Chinese. And they began to say, hang on, I mean, you guys have been doing this for so many years. And now just as we start to do it, you say we can't, right? The climate justice argument arose. But the climate justice argument arose also because we all adopted, assumed the same model of development, right? Which is why the argument was made that you have hogged the carbon space that's available for development. So that's the first thing to say so that, uh, so that the, the, the current planetary awareness is really the awareness that comes once you've realized that this flourishing the logic of the flourishing is also imperiling the flourishing. So that's why when Peter Half says that, you know, it's only because of technology and technological connectivity that we can now support, let's say, even 10 billion people. And minus that technological connectivity, he says human population will crash to about 10 million. So he then argues that technology has become the precondition for biology. For us. And, and, and that's why, so if you become a civilization so dependent on technology, and you don't want to give up on what has been genuinely beneficial for human beings, you suddenly find yourself at a fork. And the fork for me is represented by two books, both by Harvard authors. One is David Keith's book, Defending Geoengineering. And the other one is Edward Wilson's book saying, Half Earth, Withdraw scale back, right? And we're at a point where some people are saying we should do even more of what we've got, more technology, more control of the planet, manage it. And some people are saying, no, 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 scale back. Now, it's not an either or four, we'll probably do a mix of both, you know, for both good and bad. Uh, but I was just trying to, well, the point I was trying to make is that before we condemn our geological agency, let's realize that it is that agency, our increasing kind of involvement with planetary processes that have been at, uh, that have, that's what, what's enabled our flourishing. Thank you.
you know, this might be an, a, a place to get to a question. It's funny, it's, I, clearly Simon and I were reading the same <laughs> newspaper the same day. We both encountered a story. Um, so I kind of want to maybe I'll ask a question about, it's related to what you just said. It's actually about population. And I think Simon has a more, another kind of related formulation about that. We both noticed it, that, that, that headline the other day, uh, long slide looms for world population with sweeping ramifications. And again, Simon has a more specific question about that. But I want to ask about something a little earlier. I'm curious, I guess I would say to start more generally about how certain population anxieties at different moments, you might say in the last, right. in, in a, over a number of decades, structure how we think about globe, planet, Anthropocene. I'm thinking, I was thinking more about the moment of, um, you know, the, 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 the Rome Club report, Limits to Growth, the Brundtland report, the population bomb are hitting at a certain right. moment. Right. Um, so maybe maybe we start there with, and, and, a, and a general question about population anxiety and how it, it's a, the, the feedback loop with some of the concepts you're working with. And then, and then I'll pass it back over to Simone to ask a more specific question about that. Right. Your Times piece that came out lately. So, did you have a question, Joe? Yeah, I, I, so the question really is about how we understand kind of anxiety of population anxieties about uh, inflation, deflation, you know, relative to the to the current moment. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, see, so the anxiety takes different forms. I mean, when uh, uh, when the population bomb book came out, uh, the anxiety was that you wouldn't be able to feed so many people. And then the Green Revolution came, artificial fertilizers came. And if you read Amartya Sen on this problem before he became aware of global warming, uh, you would see that he, would, he was writing, explaining the distribution problem, that we can feed them. It's really a distribution problem, right? It's a problem of social justice, uh, the, the question. Of, so he was saying, we, we don't need to be anxious on this question of whether we can feed people. Some other people point out that population uh, overpopulation is a relative concept. If you look at consumption, then maybe the developed West is overpopulated. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, if you look at just numbers and uh, uh, density of population, China and India may be uh, overpopulated in that sense. And the question is not the anxiety is not whether people can you can feed them. The question is what kind of impact does uh, uh, or do the demands of, let's say, 10 billion people that they'll make uh, legitimately and reasonably, what kind of impact would that have on the biosphere and on the other planetary processes? So what I found interesting in an Earth System book saying that the problem with modern agriculture is not that it, it can't feed people. It can, but they said it's uniform. In other words, what it threatens is biodiversity of seeds and things. So if you think of, uh, so, so that's why if you think of the present problem only as global warming, climate change, you get some of the problems. But one problem that people also talk about is species extinction through impact. So, it, so it's a, so the population question, if we look at it purely as a justice question between human beings, you arrive at some kind of solutions, and which are fair. But, but if you look at it from, let's say, the point of view of other forms of life, or even our own situation. So the reason why the pandemic is raging so vigorously uh, is because uh, we, we're not just numbers, not, we're not just big in numbers, but we live more in cities, in crowded cities. We travel more. Uh, frequently, and 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 that's what, <clears throat> and that's where the population matters. The population matters in another way, which is that, <clears throat> and it's not a modern phenomenon. The human population is spread over the planet in such a way that it makes it difficult for other species to migrate, which they will want to as the planet heats up. When the planet heats up, even trees want to migrate to zones that are habitable for them. And some will have an easy time migrating and some won't because if, if you had species that are dangerous for you trying to go through Chicago, I'm sure you'll ask the mayor to do something about it. <laughs> so, so the population question is an interesting, it's not a simple question of blaming it on poor people. And, and I should say that any undemocratic proposition for population reduction is actually an anti-poor proposition. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's more a question about the complexity of the problem, or as some people call it, a wicked, the wickedness of the problem is what is at issue. 
I mean, I think one of the interesting things about this article that, um, that Joe's referring to that came out a few days ago, this long slide looms for world population, New York Times, is also the emotional tenor of it. I mean, listen to the subtitle, fewer babies cries, more abandoned homes. Toward the middle of this century, as deaths start to exceed births, changes will come that are hard to fathom. I mean, there's a certain drama to the story of of lowering population and in these demographic changes, the fertility stagnation and what that might mean in terms of demographic downturns. Um, and so, so the prognosis here is that by the latter half of the 21st century, or maybe even earlier, that the global population will enter a sustained decline for the first time ever. Uh, and then this decline is in fact driven by gender equality on the one hand, in that women have more opportunities to work outside the home and thus less time uh, to, or desire maybe to care for children, and also gender inequality, paradoxically, because women are still generally expected to do that kind of caretaking labor. And then, of course, the high cost of living in industrial capitalist modernity. So the Lancet says that 183 countries and territories out of 195 will have fertility rates below replacement level, below replacement level by the year 2100. So my response to that is, but this is what we need, isn't it? I mean, isn't that sort of the direction that we need to go instead of replacing the 6 billion that we have uh, sustained by the but technosphere? It's, it's seven and a half or eight. Seven and a half no. that, that are sustained by the technosphere if we can sort of reduce that. And whether there might be a kind of economic degrowth that might occur. So this is the, really the question, and maybe this is for your your Marxist uh, orientation too, is, is there a kind of para-capitalism or um, a kind of reformed capitalism that might occur as the population triangle becomes inverted, mm -hmm. where we have fewer uh, young workers to support aging retirees, and we see this kind of economic inversion, might the human world history of capitalism see a kind of denouement um, as these populations shrink, as resources are also relieved, and as pressure from the geohuman agent of humanity is, is reduced to some degree. What do you see as a prognosis no, there? It, it, it's interesting, but before the prognosis, let me get back to the first point you made about the population decline being in, in part uh, due to women's education, women's participation in the labor force and in, in the public sphere. And, and, and a friend of mine was actually writing to me about this and said, maybe it's, it's really, for the first time, or uh, or if it's even if it's not the first time, that women's reproductive capacity has become a planetary force, right? <laughs> Working for the that's that's, for a, the that's a great the way. That's a great way of putting it. Right. I thought that's what I thought. So I'm not claiming credit for it, but I can't immediately remember who wrote to wrote said this. Oh no, I remember. I should give credit to her. So it's a Portuguese um, uh, uh, woman, a research scholar, uh, Maria Gago. Uh, who was talking to me about my book. And, and this was one of the responses she had. And I thought it was a wonderful way of putting it uh, and made me see how the planetary comes into the human. And, and, and because I'd, I'd, I'd said that the only democratic way is actually women's education as, as, and more empowerment of women. And she said, yes, and because it has planetary implications now. So women's reproductive capacity is part of our planetarity in a good way. So I want to say that and give credit to Maria. Uh, I thought she put it beautifully. And, and then uh, with the second question, paracapitalism. Yeah, see, there's a book called Affluence and Freedom, translated from French, just, just has just come out uh, from Polity Press, written by a very interesting French uh, social thinker called Pierre Charbonnet. And, and one of the thing, points he makes, uh, which is also a point that Ken Pomeranz, my historian colleague, made in the Great Divergence book using the concept of ghost takers. But the point that um, uh, Pierre makes is that the gap between two terms became larger and larger in the developed economies, which is the gap was between the land you live on and the land you live from. So, so if I think about you know, what I consume today in the US, I mean, it comes from all over the world. I mean, the, the soil of the United States doesn't grow everything that I consume. And, it, and the, the richer you are, the more true is that statement of, of your consumption. 
and it's it's for that reason that people when people say we'll we'll run out of land if everybody had to live with live at this level of consumption that's the argument that there's not enough land to for everybody to hold on to this ever widening gap between the land you live on and the land you live from and so in that sense what we have now if if it's sustain even if it's sustainable it's not generalizable you'll never bring everybody up to the same level of affluence so in that sense the injustice of the present system is ineradicable so uh, so what when you're talking about para capitalism a, a more of more fair capitalism just capitalism there's no question that that morally that's more appealing the question is how do we transition to it i mean the disagreements are all about the transition uh, your um, question reminds me of a a uh, statement in michael mann's uh, book the climate wars where uh, there's a conversation between a scientist and the marxist and marxist says we have to get rid of capitalism first to fix this problem and the scientist said well if you think that we have to get rid of capitalism first to fix the climate problem then the, clearly the climate problem is not urgent enough for you <laughs> so, but but you know where uh, the, the problem is the transition and going back to i think as you were mentioning this this uh, uh this uh, indefinite time that we assumed when the un dominated global order was set up and the more definite calendar of action that time mean, but if you look at un then you will find that countries are actually practicing their decades old habit of bargaining for extra time whether it has to do with air conditioners phasing out whether it has to do with phasing out coal whether it has to do with uh, phasing out anything that's bad they're bargaining right they're using all kinds of arguments and 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 the bargaining process is delayed by the country that has the most power to bargain <laughs> and there it and it, and it stands actually reflects all its inner contradictions about class privileges class inequalities so for instance in india the, the same people who are uh, in the fossil fuel sector are also driving the transition towards solar or renewables right so which means they will also make business calculations about you know when to amortize the investment in coal or oil or gas and when to so in, in some ways the transition is the most complicated question because if the scientists are right then while we are bargaining for more time the planet the planet's climate system doesn't wait for us to bar- for the bargaining to be over which actually means that there will be more conflicts there will be more suffering therefore the other side we have to work on while working for justice is the climate refugee question the climate disaster question right so we have to sort of work on uh, adaptation adaptation questions you know how do we how do we so it's not just the imagination of para capitalist world we have to imagine a world in which we will probably have to live with people whom you may not want overnight in your neighborhood so the race question the anthropological the questions of anthropological differences and those also become very sharp and then the question of other animals <laughs> other so ant fauci ant fauci has been arguing for quite some time in his academic writings that one major reason for the pandemic is the destruction of forests and clearly because that because while the, these viruses have lived in wildlife guts for millions of years and wildlife doesn't seek us out i mean it's our destruction of their habitat that forces them to come close to us and then the viruses jump species and all of those things happen um and they and i was reading in nature an article where it says that uh, that if we destroy 25% of the forest cover that we have it will be really bad and we are at 17% so people like so when you read fauci and his colleague david morens and they have several papers together on infectious diseases on pandemics and they've been saying we are in an era of pandemics which means you can have pandemics with more frequently than ever before and and a major major reason it's not only reason the major major reason is destruction of forests now 
So imagine this transition where all these different governments with their humanist agendas about class, race, all kinds of inequalities, you know, the un, all kinds of injust injustices that they half meet, then bargaining for time. So the transition question where you end up is unknown. How you end up there is unknown. What I'm saying in my book is however you get there, you have become planetary. I mean, human beings are now uh, embroiled with planetary processes. Uh, so whether you manage those processes by withdrawing from your knowledge of what's going on, like Edward Wilson would say, or Fauci is saying in his own way, or whether you manage it by expanding your technological realm. So you might say, I don't care, I want to make profits. Let there be more pandemics. I'll have more doctors researching more vaccines. You know, I'll have quicker trial process of vaccines. I'll give more teeth to WHO so that we will go into countries where pandemics break out. I mean, you know, before it breaks out, we'll contain it. They've been, uh, there are books on these sorts of questions, you know? So what I see is that, so we're, we are, as a humanity, we're divided between these options. And, and one of the things I see is a fundamental aspect of human politics is disagreement. And you value disagreement <laughs> because it produces good ideas, it produces democracy, but it also gives all these processes a certain kind of human dimension of temporality so that we don't become one to respond to the timetable. <laughs> that the scientists might be reading off the crisis of, the, of a planetary scale. That actually leads nicely into a question I wanted to ask um, about democracy. Uh, and part of this question comes out of our current setting of our crisis of democracy, of course, with yeah. uh, the political system, the political uh, struggles of our moment uh, since, since November, but also out of the year long response to the pandemic but also out of my research on the 1950s, when um, I'm thinking of David Potter's book, People of Plenty, which argued that uh, democracy would be imperiled by a lack of prosperity within the United States as his case study, that uh, in fact, democracy rests on a certain amount of consumption, prosperity, and a forward looking sense of uh, potential and accomplishment for, for individuals. So what, um, I guess, what does this, mean uh, for a planetary age, what, what, what will democracy look like? What could democracy look like in, in a planetary age where the, the Lockean subject, uh, as, as you referred to it at one point, or the, the liberal individual is not the center of attention where it, where it is um, a, a much larger viewpoint from, from a planetary perspective. So uh, I don't know if, I guess much of the book deals with a sense of the need for politics to change but it's very difficult to pin down. So I wanted to just sort of think a bit in our conversation about what it would mean for this one specific version of politics uh, being democracy. So, so Randall, the first thing then to say from my position is that A, how do we become democratic in the arguments about climate change? In other words, how do we tolerate positions we don't agree with? Uh, and and uh, so, so my first problem is to, that's why I go back to Carl Schmitt and the idea of pluriverse to say that you will not be in a world where there won't be a Trump or a Modi, you know, or a Erdogan. And, and, and then there's the question of the swing towards authoritarianism in so many democracies, uh, not just in the US. Uh, it's, it's fascinating that you talked about Potter's book in the 1950s because that's when India opted to be a democracy. And exactly on the opposite presumptions, right? People were poor, 80% <laughs> of the people were non-literate and they gave everybody uh, a vote going against John Stuart Mill's uh, 19th century axiom that you can't have universal adult franchise before universal adult education. And they reversed it. Uh, so they actually had adult franchise before they had universal education. And that's why I think India was a grand experiment uh, just as the US was too, uh, in democracy. Um, 
but it's a question that people are also asking in India. Well, how, how, how did that turn authoritarian? Not in, an un, un, not in a sort of, nobody foisted the choice. I mean, the fact that we had 70 million people voting for Trump, uh, the anti-vaxxers, you know, I mean, they're there. And, and I mean, clearly uh, it has to do in both, in both places with failures of liberal democracy to address questions of justice, uh, questions of uh, even, or to address aspirations. I mean, the fact that the US deindustrialized without making any arrangements for the working class families. You know, my, my colleague, Gabe Winant, uh, has worked on some of the deindustrialized areas of the United States. And one of the things he documents is the feminization of the labor force in those working class areas. So men have fallen out of employment and women have gone into care industry and other kinds of industries. Uh, and, and when you look, when you step back and look at all of this, the, the American deindustrialization, it's not unconnected to Chinese industrialization or the modernization program or the coming up of factories in, in Mexico and other places. And that has all been the story of the macro story of growth. So when people say that, that from the 1950s, we have had this uh, a, a time of what they call the great acceleration uh, after Polyanids, right? A great transformation. And if you resolve those graphs, you will see that the early acceleration is in the OECD countries, the post-war reconstruction. But then the acceleration becomes sharper as the newly decolonizing countries begin to grow. And it's not always with consumption, it's with dam building, it's with infrastructure making. And then it becomes even more sharp after the late 1970s, once China begins to open up. But the Chinese industrialization and the American deindustrialization that Reagan, you know, Reagan and people decided on, they're connected. They're, they were producing this global economy. And this global economy produced a huge amount of growth and it expanded the middle class, the consuming middle class. So there was a the German scholar who in his work has reproduced a Hoover Institution report on consuming classes. And he shows that in 2000, 70% of, these are people who buy gadgets and things. So it, it, the number used to be 1 billion in 1986. Now it's three, going on to four. In 2000, 70% of the people who consumed were in the usual suspect countries, list of countries, you know, Japan, industries. Now, 70% are in India, China, and, and the, in the global south. Right? So when you step back, you step back, you see the figures for growth and of everything. Everything goes to the roof. When you, when you sort of look closely, if you're talking about what Mike Davis called the city of slum, the world, the planet of slums, mega cities growing without housing, without the sup supply of housing materials. Uh, housing stock, uh, you have people living in slums, you have rising aspirations because many people have joined the global middle classes and others want to, but their aspirations are not fulfilled. You have this huge explosion of population in, in my lifetime, Indian population. So I'm one year younger than the Republic of India, a year and a half younger. And in my lifetime, uh, the population in India has grown more than four times. And in cities, sometimes it, it, it's huge, unbelievable, unbelievable. So, so basically, when I look at places like India, there's been a certain kind of brutalization of people because everything is competitive, more competitive than before. You find, try to find a good, good school, good hospital, you know, good transport, everything is competitive. And so people live with an everyday sense of competing with one another. And over decades, sensibilities change. And if you suddenly get a political leader who is a bully, who promises to cut through all this by being cruel and, 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 and strong and powerful and cruel to people that they can identify as scapegoats for the situation, uh, you can see how it's precisely the processes of great acceleration, the processes that show up as great acceleration on those graphs also contribute to the weakening of the deliberative side of democracy. So the democracy then becomes about elections. And as it, technology grows with AI, artificial intelligence and big data, then you get the stories like 
like the Cambridge Analytica story, right? Basically, all our personal data are now sold. You know, whether it's WhatsApp, Facebook, whatever. It, somebody collects it, uses it. And if you look at the history of advertising in politics, I, I find fascinating when advertising became an industry and people were writing about the, the you know, the, the invisible persuaders or what persuaders or those sorts of books. It was thought that advertising worked through an individual psychology. That it's by speaking to your need for your uh, instinct for jealousy or competition that I will sell you a product. But now they've realized that human, human behavior has an aggregate characteristic. You don't have to go through the individual. So in my economics department, colleagues are work teaming up with psychologists and applying the lessons they learn working with rats to human groups to study risk behavior and collective behavior. And that's what uh, one of my colleagues got the Nobel Prize sort of you know, on to working behavioral economics, what they, they call it. And so in some ways, it is, well, one might say that it is more our species characteristics that, that selling things depend on. You know, that we, we have the capacity for greed, we have the capacity for fear. We, you know, it's like you sell things on, on collective instincts, not working through human individual psychology. So all of these things are antithetical to the precepts and the premises of liberal democracy. I was really interested that uh, in the book, you make a case that we need to retain the rationality of the enlightenment yeah. to, in order to work through these problems. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you why. And sometimes I have trouble with the fact <clears throat> that many people who from the humanity side who work on climate change or global warming don't have enough of an acquaintance with earth system science or the science that actually backs up the proposition of global warming. So they come and say, so they think that only by changing our attitudes, we can fix it. So what they do, they go to particular, and this happens sometimes with colleagues in anthropology. So they go to particular societies where humans have lived on completely different relationships on the assumption of different relationships to nature. Humans have not thought of them as exceptional. Humans have sometimes thought of themselves as belonging to the animal world. And, and there are very many, very inspiring studies. So I'm not saying there's nothing to be learned from it. There's a lot to be learned from say, say indigenous societies and the principles by which they have lived. There's a lot to be learned. But sometimes in posing that problem, people don't realize that the, that the, the climate system of the planet, if the science is right, depends on many things working out that humans don't even experience. So there's a role that the oceans have, oceanic currents have, and humans don't live there. The Siberian permafrost has a role to play. The Atlantic conveyor belt has a role to play in transferring cold water and hot water, right? So the, the temperature gradients, now, these are not part of human experience. And that's why they have this category like the earth system. So it's, I mean, apart from the legitimate question that some economists raise as to whether or not that while the principles of indigenous societies are extremely uh, laudable and, 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 and worthy of uh, emulation, whether, uh, whether such societies can be scaled up to service 10 billion people. Now that's another question. But I'm also saying that, um, that once we understand that the, the planetary climate system depends on many, many things that we don't experience as human beings. It's like the oceans, for instance, that they do, or what deep earth does, or what glaciers might do. It's some in other aspects of nature that we don't we didn't necessarily deal with we have to deal with uh, that the question of uh, humanist responses where we say can can we do something just on our own to fix the problem without having to think about this other thing called the planet the earth system. I kind of want 
non-human construction, even though it's constructed by humans. Uh, to me, it sort of misses the point of the predicament. Otherwise, I sometimes uh, what I read are almost stories that say, well, if humans went back to a point zero in our history, we could lift ourselves up with our bootstraps. Maybe I'll jump in here um, with a question, but before I do that, let me just remind the audience some questions are starting to roll in through the Q&A. So let me encourage attendees, please uh, post your questions in the Q&A and I'll be getting to them very soon. Um, this is sort of coming out of, of, of Randall's question. And I'm also trying to not think about economists and psychologists thinking about the populations of rats so they can sell me things right now. But, but I wanna ask about um, uh, what, what I really admire about your work, about the book especially, is that it puts pressure on words that I thought I really understood and I often realize I don't. And one of those is agency. Um, there's, a, there's a way as I look through the book, I mean, so maybe the most brutal form of the question would be, what is agency or what are the forms of agency we need to be thinking about? Um, you refer to biological agency, geological agency, so many kinds of political agency, right? Within and beyond environmental studies and energy humanities, people think a lot about who or what can act or has agency. Um, if you could say a little bit about that from your point oh, of view, there seems to be so much about that in your book. Yeah, and thank you. And because it also gets me back to one of the questions that troubled me in the very beginning, uh, because I realized that the, the word agent in the expression geological agent is something different from speaking about the agents of the working classes. So I think of agency and interest as two English words that kind of traveled from the domain of commerce to the domain of the social sciences and political thought. So uh, interest is obvious, but also if you think about agent, long before we talked about agency, you had a shipping agent or your lawyer was your agent, right? somebody who spoke for you. So logically, when we brought made the word agency a more democratic word, we were saying you can speak for yourself. So it became more an aspect of your uh, autonomous capacity for self-expression and your capacity to project yourself out in the world. And that also kind of overlaps with the Lockean notion of agency autonomy. Uh, so it's, it's also part of political thought, but it's really E.P. Thompson's generation in historiography that brought that word. So 60s agency flourished, social history 60s you know, agency flourished and, um, uh, in histories of slavery, in his, histories of working class, uh, all, subaltern history, all of these things, women's history, uh, everything. I mean, sub, that's a question of yeah. So if you think about <clears throat> our awareness of the of, of, of humans uh, as agentive people, then I would say that until this planetary consciousness began to circulate, uh, we were, the way complex industrial societies managed the human beings was by taking compartmentalized views of the human beings. So if you were involved in a car smash and you were responsible, then the word responsibility in law or culpability would look on you as an autonomous person, unless you were insane or under the influence, whatever, under the influence is your choice, so it goes back to autonomy. But uh, if you had an ulcer in your stomach, then from the 80s on, the doctors would say, it's not your agency that brought it on, there's a bacteria, H. pylori or whatever it's called, that can be treated, right? So the doctor didn't take a Lockean view of you as a human being. He actually thought about your microbiome. And in his view, your body was a colony of microbes of different kinds. So in fact, you didn't even have the agency of the Lockean kind, your body was a nodal point, you know, where all these other living creatures had congregated. And we're having a great time, sometimes helping you along, sometimes fighting you, uh, creating problems, uh, right? So in a way, it's fascinating. You know, the virus is, always reminds me that the body is the first site where we forget the planet. The body is the first site where we forget that this is deep history. <laughs> 
you know, the fact that I can hold up this mug and look at you in the way I'm doing it, it's because I have opposable thumbs and I have binocular vision. This, this has been built by millions of years. And your microbiome, now people say that sometimes these mi microbes in the body even have a role in producing the feeling, producing the chemicals that help you to feel the feelings you feel, right? So you might think that, like, you know, Bruno Latour used to jokingly say, you, you, you think you are craving for chocolate. It might be your microbiome <laughs> craving for chocolate, right? So the question of agency was getting complicated. Uh, already with the rise of these sciences, right? Even before the climate question came in. But now I realize that, uh, that the body is the first site of forgetting. Uh, and, you know, and the way you, way you acknowledge and forget was, um, uh, so a former student of mine, Arvind Langovan, recently, he read my book and wrote me a very beautiful letter in which he said, Dipesh, you know, I realized that my, all the time I was in Chicago doing my PhD, a Tamil guy, he said, my mother used to write me a letter and the first sentence would always say, I am well and healthy. I hope you are too. And then the letter would talk about other concerns. And, and that's like, he said, it, it was like way of my mother saying, I hope no infectious bug has got to gotten to you. But, but, you know, my body and its openness to the microbiome is my connection to planetary history. It's my connection to planetary history. What the pandemic means is that our civilization got into a stage where we have made ourselves vulnerable so that the planetary is more visible and we're suffering. This is the bad planetary. If women's reproductive capacity can bring, you know, social history of reproductive capacity can bring population down, it's good planetary. But we have become, so that's why the agency question is fascinating. It, it, it gets complicated and it's really, I really, it's only after getting Arvind's letter, I thought, huh, so the body is where we first acknowledge and forget in everyday life. Our, and that, the thought came to him on reading the chapter on uh, the Dalit person that I've written, the suicide. And, and where I was saying that, look, uh, the so-called untouchable body in India may have been that civilization's perverse way of acknowledging our connection to waste matter, to dead matter, to living matter, you know, but because we have, because, but we, what we did civilizationally was to label the person in whose body we recognize the connection as untouchable. So uh, it's almost like socially saying that person became my skin. It, that was the site where I forgot my planetary and by consigning it to him or her. That's also an incredible line I have to say as a, as a poet, as I read scholarship, even the, 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 the lines that sort of evoke you know, the body, the first sight of forgetting the planetary. So uh, I was also thinking of this, those sorts of greetings. Um, um, how are you? How is your health? But also even how is the weather? They function in this complicated way. Absolutely. And that, so that, so that it becomes the part of the fatigue. Yeah. And, and the fatigue is normally how you express the givenness of the world, right? Uh, and so you kind of both remember and forget the planet. Um, I want to uh, go to a question from the from the audience um, by Basit Abu. Um, this is a question on the technology as an enabler of climate change or its mitigator. When you were talking about increasing populations and their feeding demands were met by Green Revolution. Um, however, also at the center uh, of meeting this food demand was refrigeration technology, which came way before the Green Revolution, yet is problematic. Um, and then a another part of the question about this centrality of technology, um, the Sahajan Glacier, glacier the world's highest battlefield between India, Pakistan, and China, while the glaciers are melting faster than ever. Um, your comments about um, Levin Krenzberg's famous uh, law, all history is a history of technology. Well, since uh, Barsi Tabu is writing from Delhi, I, I can mention that, uh, it, incidentally, the Indian edition of the book has just come out. Uh, it came out yesterday. Uh, so, uh, so I have a chapter in which I discuss the problem of the air conditioner in Delhi, uh, because there is, a, uh, there is this uh, phenomenon of poorer and poorer people buying air conditioners, sometimes collectively, and that both producing well-being for them and increasing their life chances while heating up the city even more. And they're making this trade-off. The assumption must be that, uh, <clears throat> that 
that if when Delhi becomes really unlivable, their children will have acquired enough skills to be able to move somewhere else that was livable. So, so one of the arguments they said, look, my our children can now sit up all night and prepare for their exams. Uh, you know, so it, it so the air condition is part of the social aspiration, so making it possible for you. To, so the air conditioning is very much a, a, a part of this story. And at the 2016 conference in Rwanda, India bargained hard to be amongst the countries that would be the slowest to change because the market is booming and it's booming among people who are the first time buyers of air conditioners. And actually it's air conditioning is moving down social hierarchy because the cities are getting, everybody now needs an air conditioner. So, and, and the other thing I want to say is that <clears throat> the glaciers are a very interesting point, uh, the case in point, and also see the Himalayas, uh, is <laughs> an environmental uh, scholar was saying the other day that people don't realize that the product of the Himalayas are not apples, it's water. <laughs> there are nine or some 10 rivers coming out of the mountains that service nations beginning from Pakistan to Vietnam. You know, the Mekong would be the easternmost. Uh, and there's no agreement among these uh, countries being serviced. No multilateral agreement about the health of the glaciers, the management of the glaciers, management of the rivers. Rivers and the glaciers are, are treated like national property. So in some ways, what, what you can see that the global world we created after the Second World War and the global mechanisms of nation state, you know, these are inadequate mechanisms for dealing with a, with a crisis that is planetary. And there's a kind of institutional deficit from which we're all suffering. So there needs to be other institutional imagination that also at work um, to create maybe intermediate level uh, in, uh, regional organization, an organization to manage Himalayan glaciers, an organization to look after the health of the Amazon forests. Uh, you know, things that are critical to the climate of the planet as a whole. But we're not there. We are, the nations are still in that bargaining mode, you know, internally differentiated, but presenting themselves as one persona at, at the global bargaining table. And I think that's an inadequate global model of politics. If I could ask, uh, how much of that do you think stems from lack of awareness? I'm, uh, I was struck by your earlier mention of the, the Haber-Bosch process and the importance right. of fixing nitrogen. And it brought to mind uh, that even highly educated people who, who I've uh, encountered in class when I mentioned that you know much of the world population wouldn't exist without this process uh, at this moment, um, they've never heard of it. So the highly educated people are unaware of, of these processes. So do you think greater awareness will, will be of course, a major part no, of the problem. Randall, I couldn't agree more. I, I actually think messaging, messaging, messaging is going to be part of it. I mean, we as teachers, I think we have a lot to do uh, in changing curricula, in creating new courses, which are, you guys are already doing. Some of my colleagues, said, it's happening. I mean, it doesn't always happen at the pace at which you want it to happen, but it's happening here initially. In my observation, it was happening more in the liberal arts colleges because I think the research universities get more siloed and, and, and scholars get busy with their specialist publications and think, oh, why the hell should I you know, be involved in this? But the more I see things, I think the message has to go to high school kids. The message has to go to the generation that is not already so invested in the past. See, somebody like me facing retirement and a short period on the planet. Uh, I kind of instinctively want my retirement investments to work. <laughs> you know, I mean, my knowledge might tell me that they, they may not work, but you know, instinctively you think after me the deluge, <laughs> you know, but I actually think that that's why students are very important, intergenerational conversation is very important and people who have not yet invested in the system, you know, who will become the business leaders of tomorrow, with different visions. So I'm going back to what Simon was saying about para-capitalism. And we have to work through capitalism. I, I'm, I'm not the person who would say, destroy this first. And you know, and also I think we have to think about employment. We have to think about sustaining people's lives. We have to think about uh, not doing this at the cost of the poor, the transition. 
and and kind of and sharing the cost. I mean, so that the more privileged people actually share in the cost of the transition. But to do all this, you also need different kind of idealism in in business schools, in kids we you know young people we teach. So knowledge, messaging, and it goes back to your question of democracy. So we need more educated citizens. Right? We, we need more people to read Edward Wilson or to take mental part in these debates, to read David Keep, to, to debate whether geoengineering is a good way to go or not. And I think that's been a part of the problem. I mean, I now hear economists, I read economists, some economists asking for social regulation of uh, technology, of AI and all those things. It's a very difficult thing to do because we have spent decades saying social regulation is bad, right? and at least in this country, and in, and in India, it's a new dogma that's come that social regulation is bad. Uh, a businessman told me the other day, you know, in India we need the economics that Chicago teaches, and actually Chicago doesn't teach this economics any longer that social regulation is bad, uh, but. So I think messaging is absolutely important. And I, I, I did do some work in India through my Chicago center in Delhi with school kids. And the amount of interest is unbelievable. And I think, and whether you like Greta Thunberg or not, I mean, I, I, there could be criticisms of the style and, and how she did, but she did put the matter on the agenda for school kids. I mean, she inspired school kids. So I think messaging is, ap and as an academics, that's something we can do. I had a question for you, Dipesh. I mean, yeah. I don't know if this is a fair question or not. Um, your climate of history essay has been so influential in conversations, academic conversations, political conversations about the Anthropocene, global warming, how do we approach it, a real touchstone. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think has changed since the publication of that essay in the world? Or what, has, what do you see as the most significant changes that have occurred? from your point of view since that first came out? Two, you know, I mean, two. I mean, the crisis has deepened. So by 2015, people had actually bracketed the justice questions and gone to nationally determined contributions. Right? So the whole question of per capita emissions that came up in the Rio conference, you can look at the 2015 uh, Paris conference as putting those things aside saying that the crisis is so urgent and it's deepening so fast getting on, that we can't go on arguing about this you know and also india and china are kind of as peter singer used to say prospectively guilty if the west is retrospectively guilty and even that that uh, document that agreement was produced on a technological gamble that by 2070 or whenever you'll have the the capacity to draw greenhouse gases carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester it somewhere safely. It's a technology we don't yet have. It's a very experimental, no guarantee we'll have it, we may. But the, the gamble was in the footnotes uh, in, the, in the climate deal. So the, the crisis is getting deeper. But also I think the other thing that has changed is the rise of authoritarian regimes across the world. So the decline of democracy and the deepening of this crisis are two I think connected phenomena we're dealing with. And then the, then the pandemic reminds us of the degree of that environmental crisis. So three, unfortunately, instead of, you asked for two. <laughs> There's another oh, question. Sorry, yeah. sorry, Joe. Oh, no, that's okay. I was, I, Simone, I didn't mean to cut you off if you had another question. Okay, I was going to jump in with a couple of questions in the um, the chat again, reminding our audience, please fill, fill in the Q&A if you like. Um, our, you know, our colleague Gisela, hello Gisela, who's uh, tuning in from, from France, I'm interested in um, what you have to say about a nature culture divide, right? Um, um, and, and Gisela works in Latin American studies and, and in ecology and also teaches our environmental justice courses. Yeah, interesting the idea, will an enlightenment logic uh, prevent us from thinking differently about nature culture, right? Especially, and, and solving the, the crisis at a planetary level, as you're suggesting, and not the sort of restricted, un, uneffective global level. So a uh, great question, Gisela, and uh, 
Hope you're enjoying, Franz. Um, so actually, if you haven't read the book, the, 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 the book ends with a conversation with Latour, uh, by the way. And uh, so my short answer is this, and this is something I argue in the book as well, that um, Jane Bennett puts this very well. She says in, the, in, in this book, Vibrant Matter, she says, yes, of course, um, the nature culture distinction doesn't work. Uh, and matter is vibrant, all kinds of matter, you know. But thinking of matter as vibrant doesn't help us to solve the problem of slavery. And 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 actually, Sart makes makes a wonderful observation in his preface to Fano's um, Wretched of the Earth, uh, and it's an observation that is, I think, not original to him. I think it goes back to Hegel. But he says, it's only by recognizing another human being, perversely as human, that you enslave him. In other words, you don't enslave an animal. Uh, a dog may be obedient to you, but a dog is not your slave. Whereas you can enslave another human being because you, you recognize him, another human being. So there's a kind of perverse kind of human recognition. You know? the, the thing I want to say there is, is I say in the chapter on um, the difficulty being modern is that see the climate the technology that came out of the nature culture separation and created this world with all its problems so including the military technology uh, that uh, led to the competition in space and everything, is the same technology that gave us the science of earth system science so, so if you speak of the climate crisis scientifically, then that is reasonably in that sense. You can't do it without all the technologies that were produced, also to that took part in the in the in the in the production of the crisis. Uh, so, for instance, you know about ancient air. You know the argument that 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 the concentration of greenhouse gas is um, higher now than at any other time in the last 800,000 years comes from uh, examination of ancient air caught in bubbles in ancient ice. Now, how do you get ancient ice? You get by boring into ice. What's the technology for boring? It's the same technology that oil companies use, but that's kind of modified for boring ice, right? So uh, actually Paul Crutzen made this point. He said, it, he said, "For this, so if you if you if you take the position that you are not going to think of climate crisis scientifically, but think of it in some other ways, because look, uh, global warming can happen even without science and technology. It can happen through a volcanic eruption. It can happen through an asteroid strike. So it's entirely possible to think of it another way. You don't have to think of it scientifically, but the knowledge that the climate of the planet works as a system." is available only through the scientific investigation. Now, then, having said that, then there's an interesting debate between Latour, Tim Lenton on, on one hand, Tim Lenton being uh, having been somebody who was a student of James Lovelock, the Gaia person. And they make a very interesting distinction between Gaia and Earth system science. And they think that Earth system science is a generalizing science while Gaia is poetic and singular to this planet. So therefore it would be absurd to look for Gaia on other planets. And, and, and that's an interesting position. Uh, so, so I would make a distinction between actually, again, a Habermasian distinction perhaps between uh, science and technology, only a logical distinction uh, for analysis, analytical distinction. It's not a historical distinction because if you look at the history of science and technology, sometimes science leads to technology and sometimes science comes out of technology. So one of the great concepts in physics of entropy actually comes out of people trying to produce perfect steam engines with 100% efficiency and then empirically realizing that engines can't be made 100% efficient. And pondering that question, they come up with the idea of entropy. Uh, so I, while I agree with Latour's 
critique of modernity by what he does with the nature culture divide. Um, I just think that if you value human life and 10, 000, and 10, and 10 billion humans or 9 billion humans, it's very hard to see how you can give up technology and, and sustain these lives. So it, you really have to think about how to scale back. It's, it's, for me, it's not a question of giving up on science, but it's a question of scaling back, not, not sort of uh, destroying the forests in the way we are, um, eventually allowing through, as I said, the planetary role of female reproductivity for the population to go down, needing more democracy in that sense, empowering people. Uh, but I, but so uh, I I philosophically see what they're doing, and I think there's a lot to be learned from societies in which nature culture distinction was not made, because those have been the most sustainable societies. And and there are principles that we need to learn, but we need to then also learn to adapt them to our conditions. I mean. In that, in that conversation with Latour, I, I asked him, I said, do you want to give up the MRI machine? And, and he says, no. Maybe we can um, end with a final question from Tina Chatterjee. Um, the question, is it ineffective then to believe that politics or policy has any longer an agency role to play in the humanist history of the Anthropocene? And maybe I'll add to it, and I hope not to sort of distort the original question to say, what are the kinds of change and the levers of change now, uh, given everything you've had to, had, had to say and, and, and given everything that we think about when we read your work? No, I think, I actually think that policy and, and politics, uh, and here I think as politics, so you, the, I don't use the word politics in the way that you're using it, but here it seems to me that your word politics would uh, include both politicians and activists. Uh, and I, I define politics in a, in a more in an Arendtian fashion. I say that um, political action is that which helps humans to be at home on earth beyond the time of the living. So, uh, because I was wanting deliberately to take a more capacious understanding of what the political was. Uh, but I think these are all very important uh, they have important roles to play and, and, and criticizable roles to play because we will not always agree with every politics and every, every policy. But so let me say this, the, the crisis has an urgent side to it. My book doesn't address the urgent side because I think in my life, I address the urgent side as a citizen. So when I, said to Randall, we need to message. And that's my, that's the teacher in me speaking as the citizen self. But the book is really the thinker in me, sort of bracketing the urgency for a little while to say that this is a crisis that is producing very interesting challenges for how I have been trained to think as a historian. And so it, so it took me down a certain path of thinking and, and, and I eventually realized that I'm thinking about the human condition because uh, however, whatever your politics, whatever your policy, I think either politics or policy will be helped if you, uh, if you agreed on the change in the human condition because that would include all the frailties of human of being human in in addressing the problem that's a really powerful place perhaps to to end thinking about frailties thinking about um that other end of scale this the, the smallness of uh, individual humans or even humans who can impact a planet and yet are so small next to it in a way um i want to thank you professor chakravarti for your generosity um in spending time with us um in a certain way over these last 10 years but especially today um for this symposium for the kind of final session of our first day um i want to thank our my colleagues randall and simony for their fantastic questions and the great 
conversation we had in advance about your wonderful book. Um, and to all of you who have stayed with us um, at the end of a very long year of Zooming, <laughs> we're, we're aware of the, the fatigue that comes with it, but we're also um, very much moved and energized by the conversations we've been able to have virtually that we might not have had right in person. Um, and the last thing I just want to say is just to remind you all, we've got another day of three sessions tomorrow beginning uh, in sort of central time around 11 a.m. You can um, find a link for uh, registration for those sessions tomorrow. And I'm really looking forward to the conversations to, can, to come. So thank you so much, Professor Chakrabarty. We really appreciate your time and your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This was a very enjoyable time. Thanks for having me as part of your program. Yeah. Thank you very yes. much. Stay well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks Take very care. much. Take care. Good night, everybody. Take care. Bye.